Ladies and gentlemen, Marshall Brown. Hello and welcome to Water Matters. I'm Marshall Brown. Working in the environmental field can be hard. We often find ourselves up against well-financed opponents and sometimes we struggle just to prevent bad things from happening. But every once in a while the stars line up and the right people are in the right place at the right time to really make positive forward progress on an important environmental issue. It happened recently in New York State with fracking and it happened 22 years ago on Long Island. The issue then was the preservation of the Pine Barrens, almost 100,000 acres of unspoiled wilderness in Suffolk County. And the undisputed heroes of the movement to preserve and protect this unique natural environment were Governor Mario Cuomo and a young man named Richard Amper. Dick Amper has been a fierce crusader for our natural world ever since, and he is my guest this week on Water Matters. So stay tuned for his presentation and a lively conversation. We'll be right back. From the grassroots studio in beautiful downtown Port Washington, this is Water Matters with host Marshall Brown and special guest Dick Amper. Brought to you by the Jump In Campaign and made possible in part by funding from the Long Island Community Foundation. And now, here again is your host, Marshall Brown. Welcome back to Water Matters. Our guest this week is Dick Amper, Executive Director of the Pine Barren Society and the man widely credited with saving almost 100,000 acres of wilderness here in Long Island. That's 156 square miles, by the way. Well, he is. <laughs> Dick, uh, we're excited to see your presentation. I'm looking forward to a lively conversation to follow. And I want to congratulate you on your program. I think it's doing a great public oh, service on the most you. important issue facing the environment on Long Island. You're doing a great job. Thank you. I, I'm loving every minute of it. Good. Catch you later. Absolutely. And I'm delighted to talk about my favorite uh, topic today, it's uh, the Long Island Pine Barrens, and the question I think on everybody's mind is, uh, what's that have to do with uh, water matters? Well, the answer is that if water matters, the Pine Barrens matters a lot as well. Um, the Pine Barrens sit atop the greatest quantities of the purest water on Long Island, that's both drinking water and surface water. All of that water, as you know, uh, lies beneath our feet, and the human activity on the surface um, is going to have impact on what it is that ends up in that water. And one of the principal culprits is, uh, is nitrogen, and it is uh, wrecking havoc with our bays and our beaches and our um, surface waters, our drinking water, all of it uh, being adversely impacted. We put three million people on the top of a finite island, and um, we didn't really figure out how we were going to make sure that we didn't exceed the carrying capacity of that island, how we were going to deal with our waste entering our source of our most important commodity, water. Fortunately, um, uh, the good Lord did. He created the Long Island Pine Barrens. It uh, uh, was created roughly uh, 15,000 years ago, um, finally topped off by the last uh, glacier. And um, it is a pitch pine scrub oak woodland that once covered 250,000 of the uh, million acres that is uh, Long Island. And uh, it's turned out to be uh, not only Long Island's premier ecosystem, but a godsend when it comes to water. This is roughly where the Pine Barrens are, extending from roughly Route 112 in Medford in the town of Brookhaven, extending into um, Riverhead Town, down Peconic River to Peconic Bay, and out on Southampton to the Shinnecock Canal. Um, say, once it used to cover a quarter of Long Island's landscape, uh, by 1989, uh, we were down to about 125,000 acres left. And at that point, um, we were in trouble. These pitch pines and scrub oaks, well, they sat above this poor sandy soil that boasts the great, uh, greatest of bio, uh, biodiversity anywhere uh, in the state of New York. So it was a wonderful natural treasure, a great place uh, 
for hiking. Um, we had a vision that it would also be a great place for a preserve. But most important of all, it sat atop the purest drinking water source, the purest ground water source, and none of the activities there were compromising water quality, and it was becoming increasingly clear even then that we were facing ultimately a water quality challenge if we did not preserve some place where the water was pure, and that was the Long Island Pine Barrens. Um, it's a, a terrific place if you haven't been out to hike and, um, and explore. Um, do it. It was a battle worth fighting for, and I want to talk a little bit about that battle because the battle we're facing uh, concerning the quality of drinking in surface waters is very, very comparable to the big battle that occurred back in 1989. Uh, the Pine Barrens, we said, is sit atop that uh, drinking water aquifer system, and you've probably seen it before, the model of the upper glacial and the Magathy and the Lloyd aquifer system all of it providing pure, fresh drinking water, but the upper glacial increasingly contaminated. We're turning more and more for drinking water to the Magathy Aquifer. So these little trees that are sitting on top of this are doing something other than providing uh, homes for the birds. Uh, they're helping us remain in our home. Uh, and there's a, really a, an absolute great diversity. You see um, uh, plants and animals on Long Island that. Uh, uh, most people who live in suburbia uh, just don't even know are here. But what we faced in 1989 was a total of 234 separate projects, development projects in Brookhaven, Riverhead, and Southampton. And the towns were approving them one at a time as if one didn't impact the other. And the Pine Barren Society came forward and said, for environmental law to make any sense, you have to look at the collective efforts of all that you're doing, not just say this strip mall over here or this residential subdivision over there won't hurt anything. We have to consider the impact of all 234. And so the Pine Barren Society decided that we need to challenge what they were doing in court. And so we did. Um, this is the, the scene that was set for a major legal battle, it was to result in the largest environmental lawsuit in the history of New York State, then and to this day, um, covering all of these projects that would have destroyed 43,000 of the remaining 125,000 acres and basically turned the Pine Barrens into a piece of Swiss cheese, all cut up so that it didn't even function as an ecosystem anymore. Uh, and you can just see in the period from 1962 to 1995, look at all of the development that just moved over us west to east. And then there's that little pocket at the bottom image there uh, of the bright spot, and the bright spot is our Pine Barrens, and if you looked at it today, it would look exactly that way. The Pine Barrens Society brought the largest environmental lawsuit in the history of the state of New York on November 21st, 1989, and it stopped on that day all 234 projects, and you can imagine the roaring reaction from the developers and some other folks who had just never ever considered this kind of thing before. And our argument was that you had to consider the collective impacts of all 234 before you could approve any. This lawsuit stopped all development in the Pine Barrens for two years a total of $5.6 billion of real estate in 1989 money. Um, it was called the War Over the Woods. It ended up in Supreme Court in Suffolk County, Long Island, the lowest court in, in the system is the Supreme Court. And we lost that case in the Supreme Court. The judge said, I can't find anything in the law that says they have to look at everything. We knew that that was a real possibility, so we had already anticipated going to the appellate division um, that deals with more generalized cases, cases that have more uh, human impact than just everyday squabbles. And miraculously, but not surprisingly to us, the appellate court overturned the lower court decision and said, no, for, <laughs> for environmental law to make any sense whatsoever, we absolutely have to have an overview, a cumulative impact assessment 
Um, needless to say, the developers and the towns who we challenged that were approving these projects went to the Court of Appeals. Did we win? Well, not exactly. The Court of Appeals basically punted and said, look, they're not getting it right. We do have a threat to the aquifer system. The people's water supply is in jeopardy. We as jurists can't just cobble together a bunch of unassociated laws. The state legislature must pass a bill to protect the Pine Barrens and build into it the requirement that everything be considered, not just one or two things. We worked to bring the two sides together during the winter of 1993. And in that legislative session, there were opponents and supporters, but increasingly the developers frustrated by, by the fact that they were still not able to build, were willing to make concessions. And so what we did is we negotiated that the areas that were already developed could be developed, but only carefully, and the core area, the central undeveloped land, the land important to us today, mostly because that's where the cleanest water is and remains, that could not be developed at all. And that is a total of 53,000 acres. 47,000 acres can be developed, but only under strict regulation. And it's been in place now for more than 20 years, and it seems to be working. This was passed by the New York legislature unanimously. That doesn't happen much anymore. Um, but it was so important to the public that we get that part right. Um, people, uh, even the developers themselves, but politicians from the right and from the left um, here, uh, people like Senator Ken Laval, uh, Assemblyman uh, Tom DiNapoli at the time, he's now the state controller, uh, uh, hovering above uh, Governor Cuomo. Uh, who signed it into law that day, and a celebration, a veritable celebration in the press, radio, television, citizens coming out for the occasion to celebrate that we had finally, it was almost as though a collective will of the public had emerged and saying, the pavement stops here. We cannot continue to pave from west to east an unending series of developments that increase the cost of taxes for new government services, for schools and roads, all of what are bringing our taxes up, and at the very same time, they're compromising the most basic commodity that is required for us to have an economic um, and an environmental health. So it was very, very well received. Hailed as the Pine Barrens is saved, by the way, I should tell you that um, nothing is ever quite finished. Um, we have to continue to monitor the work of the New York State Pine Barrens Commission. It's uh, composed of the supervisors of the towns of Brookhaven, Riverhead, and Southampton, someone representing the governor, someone representing the Suffolk County Executive. They meet monthly and review applications, make sure that this law is being provided, and of course we're there looking over their shoulder to make sure that they're getting it right. But the wonderful thing about it is that the public then had to buy the land. The public was being asked then to preserve the land. In this country we don't take land from people. We have to provide just compensation. What I am delighted to tell you is that the people of Long Island are among the most environmental people in this country. And they voted to create the Suffolk County Drinking Water Protection Program, which uses a quarter of a penny in sales tax. And it was used along with the State Environmental Protection Fund, other county and town funds, to begin parcel by parcel, owner by owner, compensating them to the tune of three quarters of a billion dollars. Wow, given the anti-tax sentiment that we experience all the time, you'd think the public had pushed back hard against it. They voted by referendum 84% strong to support that because they care about water and they care about water more than anything else in the environment. All of the focus on taxes and economy and business and growth fade to obscurity when we deal with water. The public is squarely behind whatever it takes, and already we're beginning to poll. How do they feel now when those polls are reinforcing our commitment that if we give good water protection laws to the people, 
they will support them. I thought it would be interesting to go back over those 20 years and just take a, a minute's view of exactly how exciting it was and just how important it was that we protected Long Island's Pine Barrens. Let's look. When Governor Cuomo arrived at South Haven Park in Suffolk County to sign an historic piece of environmental legislation, there was an almost party-like atmosphere. After sparring for more than five years and spending multiple millions of dollars on legal fees, Long Island's environmentalists and business communities had come to a meeting of minds. 50,000 acres of pine barrens stretching through Brookhaven, Riverhead, and Southampton are to remain forever wild. Another approximately 50,000 acres may be eligible for development under selective conditions. The so-called War of the Woods was declared over, and both camps claim the settlement is a victory for future generations of Long Islanders. Environmentalists and developers say this is a law we can all live with. The War of the Woods is over, and the people of Long Island have won. Today, Long Island obtains a first-rate national park quality nature preserve and a progressive new plan for future development that will serve as a model for this nation. The Long Island Pine Barrens thus joins the Adirondacks and the Catskills among New York State's greatest natural treasures. The statewide significance of our Pine Barrens is acknowledged through the creation of a 50,000-acre greenbelt that will protect our most significant drinking water supply while we preserve a globally important habitat boasting the greatest biodiversity anywhere in New York State. It's right and no quarrel and no dispute and no equivocation. With sureness, I go to bed tonight having signed a bill and made it a law knowing that I did a right thing. Thank you for that. It's a great day for everybody. Just to sum up, though, where we are today, we're fighting a different battle. It isn't with builders and it isn't with politicians. It's with the southern pine beetle, which has arrived as a result of climate change in our environment. And these little critters, about the size of a piece of a rice, um, can take down a pitch pine tree 50 feet tall in about three months. And they move from one to another. We finally now have commitment of government from the uh, um, uh, funding from the government of the state of New York to begin to cut these trees down once they're infected. That should happen in the winter. Then we can uh, fight back. We'll never eradicate the beetle, but we can slow it down and manage it. And if we cut down those trees in the dead of winter and then replant the pitch pines in the spring, we can at least keep up with it. Uh, we lost 40,000 acres of pine barrens in the million acre uh, New Jersey pinelands. We don't want to see that happen here. So we're trying to keep up with it. And that will be an important thing to watch. And the pine barrens today, the commission is working just as hard as ever to improve the quality of the Pine Barrens as an ecosystem and to make sure that its protection of water remains paramount. That is the story to date on the Pine Barrens. I'm looking forward to uh, chatting up Marshall about some of the things that he and we are doing, all of us committed to protecting water quality for the island we all love. Our Long Island way of life depends on clean water for swimming, fishing, and clean, fresh water to drink. But water pollution from sewage, from pesticide runoff, and toxic chemicals puts it all at risk. Scientists say we can fix it. Stronger water quality standards can protect our clean water and way of life for generations to come. We all drink it. We can all protect it. Go to longislandcleanwaterpartnership.org. If we're going to solve our water issues on Long Island, we'll need an informed public. Jump in print materials about water issues on Long Island can be co-branded with your organization's logo and are available at no cost to local nonprofits on Long Island and for minimal cost to local agencies and water departments. To learn more, please visit our website at liwater.org or call our office for more information. Let's spread the word about Long Island's water. Hi, I'm Alec Baldwin. 
The biggest and baddest development on Long Island is the proposed Hills at Southampton mega golf resort on some 500 acres of land that is the largest privately owned Pine Barrens parcel remaining on Long Island. The project would include 118 residential units, a 98-acre private golf course, and a 155,000-square-foot clubhouse built on four acres with a four-acre pond area. The site is also in a state-designated special groundwater protection area, as well as a Suffolk County-designated critical environmental area. The Hills is also part of a group of lands which the Nature Conservancy has given top priority for permanent preservation. All of Long Island's water comes from beneath our feet in a system of underground basins called aquifers. Human activity on the surface introduces contaminants into groundwater, principally nitrogen from wastewater and fertilizer, but also pesticides and toxic chemicals. That's why the hills and other high-density development is so bad for the East End's environment. The Hills Project is another of the so-called planned development districts which are nothing more than density giveaways to wealthy developers. They compromise water quality, increase traffic, and raise taxes to pay for increased government services required by the new development. Recently, a broad coalition of environmental and civic activists called on the Southampton Town Board to kill the Hills and repeal the PDD ordinance. Join us by telling your elected officials to kill the Hills and repeal PDDs. Thanks. The views expressed on the soapbox are not necessarily those of Water Matters, its sponsors, hosts, guests, or underwriters. If you'd like to stand on the Water Matters soapbox and sound off about a water issue, send your script to soapbox at liwater.org. Welcome back to Water Matters, the show about Long Island's water. My guest today is the outspoken, no stranger to controversy, Dick Amper, Executive Director of the Pine Barren Society. So Dick, tell me, what are, what are you guys working on these days? Well, we're all working on water quality. Mm -hmm. So there are three things we think need to be done. Um, and this is being done under a program called the um, Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan. And what we need to do is to look at all of the sub-watersheds, the individual. We're not all the same. It's not one size doesn't fit all on Long Island. They're mm -hmm. different. They're big ones. They're small ones. They're ones that have flushing action. They're ones that don't. How many so, are we talking? How oh, many sub-watersheds uh, are there that's on Long the, That's the issue. We don't know, but we think Hundreds. more than 100. Mm -hmm. More than 100. Mm -hmm. And um, once we've identified those and we measure the loading of nitrogen, and uh, most of your viewers probably know by now, this nitrogen is coming principally from wastewater, that is our own sewage, mm -hmm. or from fertilizers. Those are the principal sources of nitrogen. That they're what is getting into water, and they're what are call, causing har harmful algae blooms, for example, and the mm -hmm. fish kills and the turtle kills that we've witnessed as a result of the proliferation oh, what of happened this in, algae. In the, in the, the just, this last but it's happening oh. everywhere. We're closing mm -hmm. shellfish beds. We're closing beaches. Um, this is something that hasn't historically happened on Long Island. But if we can reduce nitrogen, and by the way, there are cases where we have gone in and taken nitrogen control action, and these ecosystems have bounced back. So once we've measured, A, a identified these uh, uh, individual watersheds, and then B, said how much nitrogen are they facing now, then it's possible for us to put in place a regulatory system that says, if you've got a lot, well, then you're going to have to cut back in the, uh, in the future. Well, how are we going to do that? Mm -hmm. In Suffolk County, for example, there are more than 350,000 private homes with individual cesspools or septic systems on them, discharging directly into the groundwater from which we're trying to extract our drinking water and which are influencing our harbors and our bays. So, if we can find superior technology, and it is rushing along to meet the challenge, that re removes nitrogen and help the public re replace the, I want to say, 
uh, really old, <laughs> five thousand year old technology mm -hmm. of just dumping the stuff in the ground and then pretending that we don't have to worry about it. If we can get them then to switch over to affordable, we may need some tax credits, some help from government. I mm -hmm. think that's important. But as I observed earlier, mm -hmm. the public is very, very supportive of, uh, of clean water. So I think we can get buy-in from them. But if we could get that cleaned up, if we could build sewage treatment plants where they're needed to deal with existing problems and not where they're going to create a demand for new development and mm -hmm. more problems of uh, overdevelopment and all of that brings both economically and environmentally, um, then I think we turn that around mm -hmm. and that Long Island may be the first mature suburb that faces this problem. We were the first, we are the first in the nation federally designated sole source aquifer where the federal government, the EPA said, you depend exclusively for your water from the ground. We may be the first in the country that actually turns that around, threatened by the destruction of our aquifer system, and that we can restore it simply by eliminating mm -hmm. the problem that created it in the first place. We, we need to be the first. Uh, it's not a matter of maybe. I mean, if we don't get uh, the nitrogen out of our groundwater, we'll lose all our rivers, creeks, bays, everything. Or well, everything that people actually leave it. You know, they're paying two and a half times the national average in taxes, and still they love the place. And when you ask them why, it's because of the bays and the beaches and the fishing and the recreational, the boating opportunities. And so much of everybody's economy and environment is dependent upon clean water. So we're not going to be the place that, that we mean to be if we don't reverse this problem. And look, we have addressed it before. No one thought that we could uh, draw a circle around the Pine Barrens and, and save mm. 100,000 acres from continued increased development. And yet we did that. And we have the will to do it. The public is squarely behind it. I'm hearing from federal, state, county, and town officials, instead of saying, eh, aren't you exaggerating the situation? I think they're facing it down and saying yes. And even in the past, right. well, you've heard this, you go to them and they say, well, yes, that's true, but the state has to, no, the federal government, and there's finger, that isn't happening. Every level of government is saying, yes, there's a role for everybody to play. Uh -huh. And that is encouraging to me. I've been doing this stuff now for more than 25 years, and I've never seen such unanimity among people in and out of government, in and out of business, saying, if we don't solve this problem, we're goners. Mm -hmm. And the people who need to develop this technology are moving swiftly at Stony Brook University and elsewhere. Yes, like they are moving. Tech Center. They yes. ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they move, you know, industry, this, this is a capitalist country here. People are going to say, whoa, there are people all across the country that are going to need this technology. Oh, yeah. we're, we're, take, so, we're, we're taking the, the problem and, and uh, making it an opportunity. If we can develop this technology sufficiently, there's lots of other places that need it. Marshall, that's absolutely right. So economically or environmentally, it's a win-win situation. So I'm Way more optimistic <laughs> than I was when we started the uh, the Pine Barrens campaign back in 1989. Uh -huh. I wondered whether we were going to get it done. Mm -hmm. I don't have any doubt but that we're going to mm -hmm. get this one done because we have to. You know, st starting in uh, early uh, two th 2014, there were all these uh, uh, public meetings. Everybody was kind of looking at each other saying, how did this happen? How did we all get on? It was the science. They all looked at the science and said, we need to cooperate. We need to come up with a comprehensive plan among all these different uh, uh, levels of government and all these uh, different policymakers and the business community to really make this happen. And I think they also came up with another notion, and that is, how could it not happen? How right. could you put three million people on a relatively small island and say you may discharge your <laughs> wastewater into the source of your drinking water? <laughs> Why did it take that long to get caught up in the first place? If, if Nassau and Suffolk were its own country, it would be the fourth most densely populated in the world. Yet we have 500,000 holes in the ground where uh, our waste ends up. So th that's primitive. All right, so we're not looking back. We're right. looking forward. Right. And there are a lot of uh, different groups and a lot of different projects, a lot of different levels of government mm -hmm. that are invested in this. Uh, the money that's come from the federal government, 
Uh, Post-Sandy mm -hmm. has been staggering. We're close to a billion dollars that's already been injected into this campaign. The states invested in this campaign. Uh, the counties are both active. Um, County Executive Ballone has made this his top priority. This is uh, number one. And town after town, even villages now are saying, what can we do on a local level? Because there's just nobody mm -hmm. out there saying it's an overblown uh, threat. And there's nobody who's saying that we either can't or shouldn't do it. So I, I'm pretty optimistic. Well, I, I'm seeing p uh, people spontaneously organize in, in various uh, uh, towns and villages to do uh, you know, creek uh, cleanups, to uh, hold the villages responsible for, for uh, uh, protecting and uh, being stewards over uh, the local environment. And uh, um, it's, it's really... Uh, you know, we got to run to catch up sometimes. Well, it really is. We've been doing uh, focus groups and uh, polling to determine where people are coming from. You'll appreciate this. When we started this just three years ago, um, fewer than 23 percent of the public knew where their water came from. In fact, when we asked in a telephone poll where the water came from, 3 percent of them said, from the faucet, stupid. <laughs> So there was a certain amount of naive tale. Welcome to Long Island. But yeah. then when you ask them where they got their water from, mm -hmm. a third said, I buy it at the supermarket in mm -hmm. gallon jugs. Or they said, um, well, we have a filter that we put on the, the kitchen. So you have at least two-thirds of them. They may not know where their water came from. But they're worried about its quality. Right. So uh, you got now you got two thirds of three million people that are already saying we have to do something about this. That's the kind of message that our politicians understand. No, oh, in, indeed, um, it's it's going to take uh, a, a real. It's going to take everybody a real uh, collective will. The good news is. Uh, the press, Newsday, I think, has been really terrific in getting this issue out, for instance, the, the local papers. Um, News 12 has done feature after feature. They're covering the, the stories. What I like, News 12 has been doing features during the summer where they actually tell you which beaches are closed because of this problem. Right. And that's bringing it right home. You're all ready to pack up for a yeah. beach trip, and you realize it's been closed because we haven't been taking care of the water. Right. Heavy rain, beach closures. It's like... That's what happens. That's what follows these yep. days. But we're, we're going to turn that around. We'll I be, absolutely yeah. agree we are. Very good. <coughs> Excuse me. That's okay. Well, um, that was really great. And I think uh, let's leave on an optimistic note. Uh, I will ask the one last question about the pine beetle. The southern pine beetle. Is there anything the public can do to help you guys uh, thin the forest out? Maybe uh, train people to find those trees so they can be chopped down. This has to be done by forestry experts. We don't have a lot of them on Long Island, mm -hmm. so we're trying to bring them in from other states and from the Adirondacks and the Catskills. I think that when we call upon the public to reach out to their assembly people and Senate people to make sure that the Department of Environmental Conservation, the Pine Barrens Commission, and those agencies that are doing this work are properly funded, then I think that's going to happen. I think the the politicians are attuned to the need to manage the problem, but sometimes we need the, uh, the people of Long Island to remind mm -hmm. them, and they're pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a public thing as long as we mm -hmm. keep the public pressure on government to say mm -hmm. this is something we do need to invest in. Mm -hmm. We've already invested three quarters of a billion dollars mm -hmm. protecting this. It'd be a shame to lose it mm -hmm. to a little bugger uh, at this point. True enough. Uh, to all those out there, if you haven't been to the Pine Barrens, please, it's, it's just a jewel. It's just so beautiful. Hiking, canoeing, mm. fishing. Mm. We got a forest preserve out there we should take advantage of, even if we didn't have a water crisis. Absolutely. Well, thank you for making that possible for this and future generations. Thank you so much for your Thanks time. Thanks for having us. You Appreciate bet. it. You bet. Well, that's it for this uh, edition of Water Matters. We look forward to uh, seeing you next week. Until then, thank you very much for watching.